Welcome to this digital roundtable meeting about sexual violence in the Nordics. This is a research seminar organized by the Nordic Research Council for Criminology. My name is Hilde Sommik and I now sit here by my kitchen table where I normally sit when I'm the host of the Scandinavian talk show on radio Norsken, Svenskin or Domskin, which is sent every week on NRK, DR and SR. And every week since we launched our program, gender issues, sexual violence and gendered crime has been on the agenda. We've talked about Danish Me Too that bursted long overdue, about partner violence and constant laws. This week, one news story caught my eye. Swedish news reported that there will be no season of X on the beach this year after allegations of sexual violence in Paradise Hotel, another reality show. Sexual abuse as entertainment in the Nordics, that is. And in a strange way, this reminded me about some of the keynotes that we will be talking about today. Katrine Bindesböll Holm Hansen, uh, Johansen will debunk some myths about Danish values, and Maelian Schilbre will talk about the paradox of gender equality, at least we are in the Nordics. So in the next two hours, we'll learn more about which discussions that are going on in the Nordic countries, but we'll also take talk in depth about the keynote presentations online at nsfk.org. Org. You can find them all there. And since we're now sitting here in our kitchens or wherever we are, I will absolutely promise that there will be breaks. Otherwise, we will be so filled up in our heads that we can't even think. So there will be breaks in between. Uh, and I hope that this can be a live think tank with some of the most acclaimed thinkers on this area in the Nordics. We should, of course, have been sitting here together in a conference room, but this is the best we could in this uh, uh, corona time. But without further ado, I have to, to let you know the participants here. And I present them by name, and then afterwards we will talk with each separately before inviting all into a panel, a big panel. Uh, we have Marlene Schildre, Professor of Department of Criminology and Sociology of Law, Oslo University. Hello, Marlene. Hi. And uh, Stina Holmberg, Researcher, National Council for Crime Prevention from BRO. Uh, and Katrin Bindestöl Holm Hansen from Denmark, Special Consultant at the organization Lev Uten Vol. Uh, Daniela Alati Norglu. Re senior researcher, faculty of law, Turku, and Hilda Fiola Anton's daughter from Iceland. But first, we will talk about the Nord no Norse, the Nor Norwegian condition, Mylen. Uh, and you have this uh, very interesting keynote online uh, titled The Continued Existence of Sexual Violence as a Gender Equality par Paradox. And what do you mean by that? Uh, what I allude to is how the Nordics have been central in placing sexual violence on the agenda as a topic to do with gender equality mm. uh, in a way that other countries have more a, a kind of a, a interpretation that other countries have come to much later. Mm. So the Nordic country has had kind of been in the uh, steering a development where it is also an international forum now is considered a topic to do with gender equality. That's understanding sexual violations as an expression of lack of gender equality and as something that in itself produces gender inequality. Mm. And you, you in, the, in your keynote, you refer to Kaisa Ekman's, Ekis, Kaisa Ekis Ekman's article in Klasse Kampen. And what caught your eye? So she has as a starting assumption that the Nordic countries are not doing enough to, to deal with sexual violence. And as a criminologist, where I look at how sexual violence is addressed compared to other crimes, that not, that's not really an, a recognizable interpretation. 
uh, the Nordic countries, um, particularly Norway and Sweden, are quite punitive in how it approaches sexual violence. It's very high on the agenda. Me Too has had major ramifications, for example, in Sweden. So to look to the US and argue that the Nordic countries, like Kais Ekman does, arguing that the Nordics should look to the US, uh, I would argue differently and said that the US should perhaps look here. Hmm. And why? Uh, because uh, I'm not saying we're doing everything right here, but, um, but to argue for the kind of draconian ways of approaching sexual violence that they have in the UK, in the US, with mass, massive incarceration, uh, rigid control systems for people who are uh, convicted of sexual crimes, the reporting system, where they have to kind of, their, op- their opportunities to have be in the labor market, in neighborhoods and have relationships are damaged forever. And I don't think that is the way to go if we are to kind of make people not re-offend. You even quote Julian Assange. Do you remember the quote? Yeah, I don't know if he said that. It's mm. famous to have said, it's argued that he has said that Sweden is the, the Saudi Arabia of feminism. Mm. And, and that points to the fact that coming from other places and the high emphasis we play on sexual violence mm. and interpreting it as very, very serious harm in the Nordics might look very kind of strange and uh, bizarre from other parts of the world Hmm. so it goes to show for this kind of special place we hold for sexual violence as a symbolic as a symbol of where we want to be and what kind of nation and people we want to be so to and that's important in my argument in my presentation is that that means that arguments that we are not doing well to combat uh, uh, combat uh, rape then who who can be if not not even the nordics are so it goes to the kind of pride of the nation to be criticized for not being good or be kind of called out on having domestic problems to do with sexual violence. It makes it very kind of a sensitive topics in the Nordics. Yeah, it's sensitive. And, and you could also see, I mean, from the arguments from Karsta Ekis Ekman, it also stems out of this feeling that it doesn't help because the, the numbers are rising and uh, and uh, it's not enough. And then what should we do otherwise than punish harder? It's there is some there. It's logic in there, isn't it? Yes, but it's not the fact that the countries with the high, highest punishments in the world have less crime. Mm. The vice versa is actually mm. true. So the whole premise so of Kaiser Ekman has bought on American rhetoric about the power of law and the power of punishment that we don't really recognize in the Nordics. Mm. We don't see punishment as a fix-all situation where uh, the higher the penalties, the lesser the crime. It doesn't, there is no empirical evidence for that. Mm. So it's this very Americanized version. Mm. But there is also in your, in your arguments there, it's, uh, there are several paradoxes that you point to. Uh, and uh, one of them is sexual harm is everywhere and then they're thus pervasive. Yeah, so if we argue that we are, uh, that the cure for sexual violations is gender equality, uh, equality-minded politics, welfare, mm. that we kind of are, have all these good intentions and systems in place, why do we still, can, why is still the Nordics described as uh, the figures, the, 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 the way the figures, register figures of rapes are discussed, the Me Too, but other, also other kinds of kind of attention draw to the kind of uh, violations happening. So it doesn't really fit well with the idea that gender equality is the cure for sexual violence. Mm. So it's um, it, the Nordics often argue two things or different things, arguing that we are gender equality minded nations that combat sexual violence and other countries should look to us. Mm. At the same time, central people in kind of in like Kaiser Ekman and others are arguing that it's everywhere. It's like women are violated everywhere. Mm. So of course, there's very different ideas about sexual integrity, gender equality in the Nordics are present at the same time. And you talk about two ways of discussing that, in, especially in the Swedish, in Sweden, because you, you, you use Sweden here as an example. Uh, you yeah. say that it's, rape is presented in two different ways. Yeah, though it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very kind of debated topic uh, in 
in Sweden more than in the other countries, but we also have ongoing discussions there. But I chose Sweden as an example because they have this, the question of how, uh, uh, how presentations of rape and what it takes to combat it is linked to domestic political discussions mm. surrounding the Swedish Democrats and, uh, and immigration policies. Mm. So discussing the extent of rape in Sweden very easily come to be about whether one is kind of for or against liberal migration policies. Mm. So it's really makes the topic even more sensitive uh, or more difficult to discuss there. Because on the one hand, Sweden is a society where they, many people in institutions really want to combat sexual violence and want to delve into the reason why it takes place so that one can do something about it. At the same time that there are things that are difficult to discuss. Mm. So it's, uh, there are kind of parallel discussions about uh, rape not being very high because that would, uh, uh, that would uh, uh, build up under an anti-immigrant sentiment. And on the other hand, saying that it's a lot of it and it's everywhere and it happens mm. to everyone. It's so those things happen system. at the same time. Mm. It's, it's, it's part of a kind of a structural power system where yeah, it is that it's a, somehow, yeah. Mm. Yeah, so more patriarchal interpretations of reasons for, for of society mm. is present. Mm. And um, in an article I've written, is how I've written earlier, is I hone in on how the Swedish Democrats uses patriarchy theory to argue against kind yeah. of the setup for Swedish Democrats is from feminist argumentation of, of patriarchy yeah. that the Swedish Democrat can then appropriate yeah. and use for anti-immigrant sentiments. And what does that do to the discussions, you would say, in Sweden? Yeah, I think um, it's, uh, I think it's a country that very intensely wants to both do something about sexual violence, but that also are very mindful about how things look, both mm. internally because of domestic political kind of um, polarization, but also mm. to the world. So I'm also in, in the Bikino talking about how Sweden has responded to commentary about their uh, rape figures and rape policies in the rest of the world how mm. uh, and of course the Julian Assange case where he accused Sweden of being too strict on rape while in other instances there are international critique that Sweden are not doing enough because yeah. it's too much rape or something mm. because as in the other Nordic countries we've seen an increase in the re registered cases of rape in Sweden which of course as, as a criminologist this, I'm very kind of keen to emphasize that mm. rape figures, mm. as they are registered, uh, are figures about uh, registered cases of rape, things that have come to the attention of the police, mm. which there is reason to believe that a minority of the cases does. Mm. And there might be biases in which cases are reported and which are not. Mm. But you have been following also the, the, the Norwegian d debates and, uh, and how does this look here? Yeah, no, I don't, I don't think it's a very sensitive topic. I think there are many instances and debaters that are very keen to be part of it and to have an, you're supposed to have an opinion mm -hmm. on how no Norway should legislate on rape. You don't have that on other crimes. You don't expect people. Now these days we have a discussion about the, the drug reform. But mm -hmm. other than that, we don't expect people to know the content of the criminal law and expect that people have opinions on how the formulation should mm -hmm. be. Yeah. But in the case of rape, everyone has an opinion mm. about the kind of technicalities of how the law should be formulated. Mm. It's become like a common topic. Yeah. And, uh, and you say that in a way that also challenges the legal optimism that has been a key part of feminism in the region. Then you talked about Sweden again. In what way? Yeah, and that's also the case uh, for Norway. The idea that gendered harms can be fixed by criminal law and that goes to show to the strong alliance between the state and feminist movement in the Nordic countries that is different from most other places in the world mm. we're looking to the state seems like a valuable kind of valid solution it seems that to go to solution is to talk to the state and figure out this together mm. so this means that both the state are, is influenced by the feminist movement but also that mm. movement that, and its priorities is influenced mm. by its alliance with the state mm. so it, it forms both the feminist movement, but also the state formation. Yeah. So, uh, so the idea that criminal law um, is a suitable instrument, of course, it has uh, many purposes, symbolic purposes, broadly as an instrument, but as in terms of sexual 
violations or sex crimes generally, it's assumed to work in a very direct sense on people's opinions and actions mm. Mm. Uh, in a way that I find naive as a criminologist. In what sense? You have to say something about that. Yeah, why, why so just a, yeah I don't think... Um, um, it assumes that the, the criminal law has a great power over what we do. Of course, mm. criminal law is formulated to send signals to discipline us into behavior. But it takes a while for that kind of disciplining to take place. So it's not like if a country changed a formulation one year, the year after people behave differently. There's not really not a reason mm. to believe that. Mm. But of course, changing criminal law goes hand in hand with changing social norms. Mm. And it's often very difficult to say what comes first. Mm. If it is the changes in social norms that makes the change in the criminal law possible. Mm. So therefore, the power of the criminal law and social norms go together in producing change. Mm. But in debates, it's often assumed that kind of something can come from nowhere. There is no social movement. There's just a change in law. And then the social norms will change. And it's not really how there is not reason, reason to believe that it works like that. The power of law isn't as strictly disciplining mm. as that kind of argumentation presupposes it and takes now, longer yeah. time and now we see that uh, b- both sweden and denmark has now constant law uh, in norway it's still an, an not very mature debate uh, what would your answer be now that we've been and we will of course talk a lot about this during the round table meeting panel afterwards but w- how do you see that now f- as a criminologist no i think it's we had this consent kind of discussion several times in the Nordic in the Norway, mm. and it's been um, uh, it's been laid aside several times mm. uh, in legal proce- in law processes due to how uh, consent is always already integrated in how we think a force in the, in the, in in law. Uh, and uh, but I do think, and this has to do with this kind of the Nordic community, the Nordics. And of course, also should mention that Iceland also have a formulation in the law now, uh, in consent law. Mm. And that means that Norway has to discuss it because we're Nordic brothers and sisters and we have to go in the same kind of direction. Yeah. So, so it, I am sure this discussion will come with a very strong force in Norway. And I, I think, uh, and it's already on and off here. Uh, so I do think uh, we might be moving in that direction also. I don't think it necessarily has very big ramifications in terms of practice, but it might be symbolically important. All Mm. the people who think have opinions about criminal law, if they are heard, it also gives kind of loyalty to and kind of support and strengthen the state civil society relations. So there are kind of good reasons to listen to Mm. civil society, even though they might not be correct. Mm. And we will at least talk about this later today. And thank you very much, uh, Mylene. And we will uh, soon see you here now again. Stay with us. Uh, because now I'm moving over to Sweden, to Stina Holmberg Research and National Council for Crime Prevention Bureau, as it is. Uh, and you will be talking about consequences <coughs> of the new consent law in Sweden. Because Bro actually, you have a report So you can now tell us, was this working the way Sweden hoped it would work? I would say that on the whole, it has. Mm -hmm. Uh, It has affected the amount of of victim verdicts Mm -hmm. for rape. Mm -hmm. And it has been used by the courts in, on the whole, a proper way, we think. So, So there are some problems with the new law uh, paragraph about about um, one one part of of, of the law hmm. but uh, on the whole we think that it has worked as the, the lawmaker intended and it has helped women uh, as it has been discussed to, to feel less shame when they have been when they feel that they have been raped but earlier have thought that well, I should have tried to push him away harder or, or screamed yeah. or so that it's not it's not your fault if you don't. It's illegal all the same. And because you, you what you did was actually to go into all uh, all the cases and then singled out the new types and you found 26 new 
cases uh, that you could certainly say was due to the constant law. Isn't, is that correct? Did I understand? Yes, these, these 26 cases we found together with, with, we discussed it with every prosecutor to see that we have interpreted it correctly. And uh, then it turned out to be 26 cases, clear cases. But then we also saw that the, the prosecution rate had gone up much more. Yeah. And that meant that the law had affected the court's way of thinking also about those cases where the prosecutor argued that there was violence in the case. Mm -hmm. So even if the court couldn't uh, state that there had been violence, they could all the same say that, but even if, if we can't prove violence, we can prove that it wasn't consent. Mm -hmm. So that means that the actual cases were, were uh, more, there were more actual cases than 26, but these 26 we have analyzed deeply, so. Mm. And, uh, mm. and you also singled out uh, some types, for instance, sharing bed after parties as one of the kind of rape that is now defined. Uh, what, what, what can you say about these cases? What kind of violence or, or what kind of... Well, not violence. Not violence, <laughs> but what kind of rape is it? Well, it's, it's rather often that uh, you have been to a party, everyone has drunk quite a lot, and you, you are, there are many people sleeping over uh, in the same beds, and, and uh, then uh, a girl wakes up or, or feels rather soon that, that a man beside her has put her, his finger into her vag vagina. Mm. Uh, and that's rape according to the law. Hmm. And uh, also that, that uh, it has happened very quickly. She has been, been uh, hasn't had time to, to react or, or protect it, uh, herself. Hmm. And then there are also cases where uh, the girl has been, been uh, uh, has uh, had so-called so frozen fright hmm. that, uh, she, she gets so scared and paralyzed that, that she can't speak or, or, or move. She just goes through with it. And that was not always possible to, to prosecute before, but these cases are now very clearly uh, illegal. Hmm. So, And I, would, I, I, I think I can hear, or in your presentation, uh, there is also, I mean, Defendants are very happy about this, but, but prosecutors were the prosecutors were, were very uh, satisfied. But also, if you're going to be the, on the defending side of this, is uh, it's not probably that uh, easy. No, and, and that uh, we heard that from many many lawyers that mm. defenders that. Uh, they they don't like the new law. They think that is not clear enough. Yeah. And uh, we we saw that especially when it came to to careless rape, the new the new crime, careless rape, because then it is actually and the, the difficult to 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 decide what is illegal and and what is legal when it comes to careless rape. But there have only been. 11 such cases so it's and we need more precedents as they have to, these cases have to a high degree go to the highest court to 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 get help to interpret that but uh, we also get i have got quite a few calls from sad mothers to young men who have been suspected for for these kinds of crimes and it has gone to court and then they have not been prosecuted but the verdict is public with their name so it could sometimes it, it it's open on social media and and the boy has been very 
stigmatized. So mm. one has to think about that aspect too. Mm. And be because there is an ambiguity in, in this, of course, uh, since it's very hard. I, I, I mean, seen from the public debate as well, we have these debates, oh, well, oh, how could I ever give my consent? Is it writing down it on a note? Should I give it to someone? Should I have an app? I know in Sweden, there are app developers now trying to make this into kind of a, a statement that you can have on your phone. Uh, and uh, I mean, sexual contact is, uh, is very rarely about uh, asking for permission in that sense. And this ambiguity, how do you think that can be worked into, into the law uh, or into to the practice? How that could, could how what did you say? Work this ambiguity into the praxis or, of the law and how it's... Uh, I think that when it comes to the cases of, of, uh, that were prosecuted for careless rape, mm. well, we, we, these questions were really uh, in focus. But I would say that in most cases, these are very clear cases. And, and I think that theoretically, absolutely, it's, it's an important question. Uh, how, what the lawmaker uh, demands of people when they have sex, mm. um, when it comes to being very clear or, or not being very clear. Mm. And I think that question, my only answer to that is that we have to, to teach both young men and, and especially young girls to uh, women to dare to speak out mm. in sexual situations, what they want and what they don't want and not be afraid about, uh, will he dislike me if I say no? And is it embarrassing? I mean, that's because the cases that we saw, the main uh, factor, we saw all the time, a lack of communication. Yeah. I mean, they were not evil men, but they were, they didn't understand so very well. Yeah every okay. time what the girl how how the girl how a girl signals that she wants or, or doesn't want oh, to have sex so yeah and i, but, yeah, I yeah. because i i can almost read into what you're saying that you're also a little bit worried whether the legal protection for those who are reported but acquitted sufficiently strong uh and uh what you tell me yes, about I mean, the, the, we write that it's, it's, it's very easy to also follow up mm. uh, that the courts uh, and the verdicts really take both parts into account and, and the, that the level of, of proof is not too low. I mean, that, that's, that's the protection in a, in, in a democratic or what's that? Let's take it, society, that uh, both parts are heard and you should not be judged without proof. What do you say when you listen to Maile and Shelbrey's uh, talk about this uh, paradox? Yes, uh, I, I, would, I would like to, to uh, can you see this? Yes, we see it. Advertise our new, hmm. uh, quite new report about uh, reported and clear up rates in Europe, mm. because uh, my colleague Lars Levenhagen and I, we, we got interested in the question, why does Sweden have the highest reported rape rate in the whole of Europe together mm. with Great Britain? So we, we gathered a lot of data about that to try to explain it. So I want to say a few words about that yeah. as a, an answer to, to Mylen. Mm. And there were two main explanation, explanations we could see. And one was because now we're looking at reported crimes and, and Eurostat, they, they get statistics from each country. And all countries have very different ways to count how many reports there are. And Sweden has the absolutely most extensive way. To count. As soon as someone comes to the police and say, I've been raped, it is reported as a rape. In Germany, for instance, it's only reported as a rape after the investigation has concluded that it was a rape. And quite a lot of things 
it disappear. And they have different kind of, of in that case. And they have different uh, laws. In Germany, for instance, uh, it's not a rape to use a especially vulnerable situation that you are very drunk or uh, that the victim is very drunk. And that is called, that is a minor, more minor crime in Germany. And 40% of the rape reports in Sweden concern that kind of rape. Mm. Answer, that we, so what we did was that we compared, we, we, we uh, changed the Swedish statistics so that it was made in the same way that the German. We, we excluded things that were not illegal in, in Germany. We counted in the same way. And before that, it was a large difference between Germany and Sweden. And that difference, difference disappeared almost completely. Hmm. And the other thing, so other thing is that we also saw, could there be a difference and that, that links to what Mylan talked about, difference in the rate of the, the propensity to report to hmm. the police. Hmm. And I gave Per Jorgen to, if he could show my PowerPoint picture number 15, mm -hmm. he promised to help me with that. If, if it's possible, it yeah. Yes, mm. because we, 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 studied, we saw a big uh, uh, study, European study, where people in all countries were asked a few questions about what you would call rape myths, mm. what, what the attitudes to these uh, things were in the different countries. And they were asked, do you agree with that violence against women is often uh, produced by the victim, that, that it's her yeah. fault, that she, yeah. she starts yeah. it. And, and domestic violence is a private matter that should be dealt with in the family. And the, the statement, women are more at risk to be Right. Be raped, <laughs> raped by a stranger than by someone they know, which mm. is the quite in reality, it's completely mm. the opposite. Mm. And it can be okay to have sex with a woman without her consent if she has voluntarily gone home to the man yeah. at a date or a party. And if you could show uh, picture number 16, then you see the, the rate questions and yeah. that is answers and then you can see if you compare uh, and and this show how many people that did not agree to this mm. and you see in Sweden that most uh, there were negative as uh, people didn't agree about these um, statements in Sweden mm. as compared to Slovakia or Poland or even Germany mm. where most people agreed that two thirds that that uh, that if you go home to with someone I think they, they they had these rape myths hmm. and we yeah, think that that yeah. if people think that well it's it should be dealt with in the home and it's our own fault of course there is a low rate of, of reports hmm. that that is very so we we studied uh, that thing we studied if there was a, if people uh, felt safe against the the, the police. Uh, so, uh, hmm. the the yeah. uh, trust the police. If yeah, trust if they the trust the, the court system, mm -hmm. if you don't have a, a trust in the police, you don't report. Mm -hmm. And in many countries with low rates of of uh, rape, there was a low trust in the in the country to the to the police mm. and we saw the gender equality according to different measures which was highest in sweden mm. and if you see there was a very strong could could you take picture number 18 now 18 that one, that one, yes. Yeah. Sweet, uh, to the left, there is uh, how many uh, rapes uh, that has reported. 
in relation to inhabitants. And uh, these other things are, are questions about uh, equality. And, and you see, Sweden have the highest equality rates and the highest, um, highest amount of, of reported rates. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. those who have very few reported rates have very, th mm -hmm. people think that uh, it's the woman's fault and, and they have no gender equality and people don't trust the, the police. So I think this illustrates very well what Malin was mm. talking about, mm. that perhaps it's very, it's natural that, mm. that countries with the highest democratic values, uh, gender equality, have also the highest rape reports, yeah. level of oh, rape reports. Uh, yeah, interesting to bring yeah. into the further discussions afterwards. Yes. Well. Uh, so thank you very much, Stina. Uh, and now we will go to Denmark. Uh, Katrine Bildesølholm Johansen. Uh, she is uh, having a PhD special consultant at the organization Lev Uten Vold in Denmark. And uh, uh, Katrine, you, you have promised to debunk some Danish value narratives for us. Uh, and that is uh, what you've been doing in your work and uh, presentation online. And first of all, just what, what, what's your first reactions when you've heard, uh, when you've listened to Mylen and to Stina talking about, in a way it's also talking about values. Well, um, well, I have many, uh... Many thoughts. I think I don't. I haven't really gotten any them. clear. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I haven't really formulated any clear mm -hmm. response to that. Uh, I think there are some interesting uh, perspectives about um, the perceptions that we might have about what consent looks like, and also mm -hmm. how really gender equality may look like in a society and then the uh, as a as a value and how we practice that mm. and and um, as Malin said in the in the first discussion with you that we have gender equality in the nordic countries on a on a range of parameters mm. but why is it that we don't we don't really see that when it it comes to the sexual domain mm. and and i think that was really the paradox that i was that I also was interested in, in really digging into, and I think it's it's still um, something that that there's work to be done, mm. and also about how we really understand the concept of consent. What does it mean in in the context in mm. practice, really? Because you are a social anthropologist and you're not a, a criminal a, a no. criminologist, so you have been looking at. It and studied this from another angle uh, and you have talked to young people because you wanted to map out uh, both how they feel around sexual violence but also uh, how you look upon sex even yeah uh, yeah sort of tell 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 about your project yeah I was as you said I was interested in kind of exploring what kind of perceptions do they have of sexual violence, unwanted sexual experiences was really the term that I use. And then also kind of look into what kind of experiences do they have that are unwanted? What, what do these experiences look like? And how do they conceptualize these themselves? And what, are, what may be conditioning for these experiences that they have? What, what kind of mechanisms and ideas may kind of foster that these experiences can take place that are unwanted? Mm. And and that is kind of the some of the key findings that I dig into in this presentation are really that we have we have one narrative about the values that are very that we kind of like to burst about in in um, internationally that we uh, that we practice and then we have a reality when it comes to the sexual domain where young people are really confronted mm -hmm. with uh, gender inequality and expectations about how to uh, practice sexual broad-mindedness in a way that is not allowing them to really elaborate or or not elaborate but really explore their own sexuality mm. on their own terms so mm. to speak 
And I have to, I just have to say this because you, you sit in Denmark and Denmark experienced me to long yeah. after uh, <laughs> all, uh, everyone. You the rest came of after. you. <laughs> you left, uh, yeah, all the rest left of us. <laughs> and the rest of us, we were already done with me too in a way, but in Denmark, no. And of course, on my radio show, we have been talking about this the, the, the last year. And, uh, and this Danish notion of free sin, of liberal thinking about free spirited people, you're not going to be prudent, you have to open up. Uh, how much do you think that influenced that debate? Uh, a lot. Yeah. In uh, what way? Uh, I think we have, um, uh, we as a, as a, as a nation, as a narrative we have. So on an individual level, it would be, you know, different from, mm -hmm. from person to person. But in a general level, we have a perception about us really uh, being the front runner in terms of celebrating uh, sexual liberal mindedness mm -hmm. or free sin. Mm -hmm. which covers much more than the sexual domain really it's about free thinking as well being mm -hmm. able to to express your thoughts but also in when it comes to the sexual domain being able to explore your sexuality freely without constraints mm -hmm. without any uh norms inhibiting you but the funny thing is that norms are there for a reason mm -hmm. so so often there is this clash between uh uh, sexual liberated uh, liberal mindedness on one side and then having norms on the other side mm -hmm. but sexual liberal mindedness is also producing norms mm -hmm. just different norms that for instance uh, what gender equality might look like in a sexual domain mm -hmm. so the so there is a tendency to think that if we are talking about bad experiences, negative sexual experiences, we can kind of also uh, perhaps limiting, mm -hmm. starting to limit ourselves in mm -hmm. a way that inhibits our, our ability to really explore our sexuality. So there is, there have been concepts like gray area uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and that kind of, if you use those terms discursively in in um, discussions with the public, it becomes kind of blurry, really, what is, what is sex and what is then violence. Because you say, you say that also in the reports uh, or the, and the keynote you have when you look upon girls and, and boys, uh, that for boys, you have this metaphor, you have to talk about that, the, the metaphor about the lock and the key. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really the sexual double standard that is yeah. have been it's not um, it's not particular for the Danish context, but I was surprised that they had this metaphor, and it was because I was at three different school contexts and two youth um, counseling services that we have, and uh, uh, during the fieldwork I saw this metaphor and again and again. So I think it's also something that may travel uh, digitally on social media, and then they pick up on that. And and what is it? It's like you. It's, uh, yeah, is is that um, if you have uh, a key that can open all locks, then it's a really good key, right? Mm. So and the key uh, here is uh, symbolic for the penis. Mm. So that's mm. but a lock that can be uh, unlocked by all keys. That's really a bad lock, right? Mm. We can all agree on that. Mm. And uh, here the 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 lock is symbolic to uh, to a girl's vagina. Mm. Mm. And so that kind of manifests really clearly also in the way that they perceive uh, their ability to explore their sexuality. Mm. And that it puts a pressure on young people too, uh, because it, um, that metaphor is really just symbolic for some different values that they are experiencing uh, to more or less degree. Mm. That also depends on their social um, uh, social peers, the, mm. the groups that they are in, mm. whether or not they feel a pressure to adhere to these values or live up to these values, really. But the, yeah, be, yeah. because girls are expected to be both vigilant and liberal. Yeah. <laughs> and that is, I, I was thinking about that when I saw this news from Sweden where X on the beach is not no longer, we, we will have no more seasons from Sweden. Mm. And in a way, it also. <laughs> tell the story about the youth generation uh, where you're both supposed to be open, liberal and vigilant, and vigilant at the same time. Yeah. 
and for you as a social anthropologist and the world, uh, and, and also in the work you're doing in the organization, uh, what's your answer to that? I think that it's important that um, now I don't work with that uh, on a day to day basis, but I think that, uh, or at least I hope my work can kind of yeah debunk <laughs> a myth or a story about how how we practice these values how are these values we even practice in our everyday life and what does it mean for young people to what kind of expectations are they met with and i think that um one of the um, one of the kind of conflicting uh, ideas that I saw also, which I haven't included in presentations, is that they, on the one hand, they have some very clear ideas about what positive sexual experiences look like, mm. what are the criteria for these. Mm. And then they also have, can say, okay, but the lack of those criteria, for instance, lost mm. respect in a sexual encounter, if they're not there, that, then it's a negative experience and it's uh, perhaps also a, a sexual violence experience. But then when they look at sexual violence encounters, they have these, uh, they draw on these myths, these ideas about uh, how to say no in a correct way, even though they are very clear when they discuss about um, how they would interpret it, uh, interpret no or, or a lack of consenting during yeah. the sexual encounter. Yeah, and this is, this is interesting also because there is a gender gendered power dynamic uh, here but on the other hand it's also it's also social recognition mm -hmm. and uh, you use three words here I have to admit I have never heard about it before but girls are uh, divided up in three categories oh yeah yeah crid crane and tank and what is that yeah, so that was a, a, a high accusation that they uh, they just explained to me was uh, really out there being used, not uh, by all young people, not by all girls or boys, but it kind of surfaced um, several times. And there was also a song uh, about uh, uh, girls as cranes. So it was there in, in the... And what is it? Can you explain what uh, the difference is and what it yeah. is? Yeah. Uh, so, so there's crit, which is the top, and this is a good-looking girl. That's mm -hmm. a term used for good-looking girls, girls that boys would like to have sex with, mm -hmm. in a heterosexual context, of course. And then there is uh, crane, which is uh, not a good-looking girl, but a girl you still like to have sex with. Mm -hmm. And then there is tank, and that's just ugly girls that you wouldn't touch. Mm -hmm. And that division, of course, places girls in a hierarchy. Mm. And what I think is really important also that I want to hope we can discuss is that if we think that a way of um, preventing sexual violence is, it could be by learning young people to communicate better, I think that uh, would be a failed strategy mm. because they already know how to interpret normative refusals. They, they interpret refusals on a day-to-day -day basis in all other encounters. They can yeah. read people perfectly yeah. clearly. Yeah. But in a sexual encounter, something else is at play. And it's not about not refusing or not interpreting. It's about, firstly, it's a way to gain respect we all want respect. Our access to it is, is different depending on gender in this context. Mm. We also want a, a status. Mm. Boys can gain status from mm. having sexual experiences, boasting about them, talking about them uh, afterwards. Girls' ways of refusing is not respected equally. Mm. So one girl who is refusing in one way, in a normative way, using all these uh, you could say excuses, uh, mm. which are perfectly well-recognized ways of refusing things in other contexts without hurting the other person. Mm. Saying, I, I don't feel fine right now, I'm mm. not sure. Mm. Those are ways that we refuse things in a day-to-day -day, mm. uh, day life, which is, uh, doesn't create confusion. And it, it's also a way of caring for the other person that we don't say, I don't like you. It's like, mm. it's about me. Mm. Um, and, but, and what's your those are not respected. Uh, what what's, what what do you think is the solution then? 
I think it's about, uh, first of all, uh, kind of talking about that these values are at play. Young people don't talk about this when I, at least not in a Danish context. Hmm. When I was out there, they said this, <laughs> some of them said, oh, well, we never talk about this. We've never talked about these uh, expectations. And, and one group of girls, they talked to their counselor afterwards and said they felt so empowered because now they have finally talked about all these unwanted sexual experiences and mm. norms they had to uh, to deal with in a daily life. It does take it for granted. Mm. So one way would be start talking about these and, and, and also talk about why is... Why is status and respect important for us as humans? Yeah, yeah. Hmm. Hmm. yeah. Very, very interesting. And thank you, Katrina, because we, we will move on to Finland. Uh, and uh, we will say hi to Daniela Alatinoglu, senior researcher. I think I said wrongly because uh, you were supposed to be here together with a colleague. And she is, uh, she is not here with us. But you are here, you're a senior researcher, faculty of law, University of Turku. So welcome to you, uh, Daniela. And you mm. have been looking into uh, the, the Finnish Sexual Crimes Legislative Review. Uh, and you have this keynote where you talk about from the perpetrator's coercion to the victim's lack of consent with a question mark. Uh, and where shall we start? So um, I could perhaps say that this uh, keynote is both sort of a reflection on a, an investigation that I did together with uh, Heini Kainolainen and, and uh, Johanna Niemi at the University of Turku. Uh, it was commissioned by the Finnish Ministry of Justice in connection to the review of the chapter that looks at sexual offenses in the Finnish criminal code. Um, so it was a um, it was a reflection on, on uh, sort of the findings of this or some of the findings of the report where we looked into why so few cases of reported sexual uh, violence actually proceed to a guilty verdict and a sentence. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is, of course, not something that is unique to Finland. It's something that is um, happening in, in many, many countries, uh, that the attrition rates, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to sexual crimes, is quite high. Um, so we were looking at this um, and sort of trying to highlight um, the shortcomings of the current law and seeing what kind of sort of procedural um, uh, obstacles mm -hmm. there were, um, and how this could be um, could be then changed for for the new uh, law. And there is um, the Finnish uh, uh, criminal code is currently still under review. Um, there is a very sort of long um, long standing debate on. Um, consent, uh, sexual violence. So the intention of the current government is to introduce a consent-based legislation. Mm. Uh, but um, there has been quite a lot of public debate on, well, uh, partly on consent, uh, also on sentences. Mm. That's, I think, quite popular in many, many Nordic countries, as far as I can hear from the other keynotes. Um, and also then, uh, for example, sexual offenses against minors and the age of consent. That has also been a, um, a uh, sort of a, a question that's uh, discussed a lot these days. And when you listen to the others now and you have heard from the experience, the Swedish experience, uh, if you compare it to your situation, how does it look like? Okay, so I think that is uh, that is an interesting question because Finland, uh, in many sort of legal senses and also perhaps societal senses, mirrors itself against Sweden, uh, which I think we're not the only Nordic country to do. Um, and sort of looking at the developments and looking at the uh, legislative amendment uh, in Sweden that was that was enacted in 2018. Um, so the consent-based uh, uh, section on rape um, 
for example, is something that uh, the Finnish government has been looking a lot to and the Ministry of Justice, then uh, it's something that's mirrored and something that uh, is seen as uh, sort of a model for where perhaps the Finnish uh, criminal code is uh, moving, but also something that is, I think, reflected upon and sort of um, the government is trying to follow also the, the sort of follow up of the Swedish, um, the Swedish amendment and the debates to try to avoid um, sort of the shortcomings or the possible shortcomings that that law can have had. But I would say that the Swedish, um, the Swedish example is very, very important in the Finnish context, um, both legally, but also sort of socially. Like that also is true for, for example, the different Me Too initiatives, mm. um, which um, there were some initiatives in Finland, um, but it was a much, much sort of smaller movement mm. uh, in comparison to Sweden. And Sweden mm. is sort of in one way seen as the role model and in other ways, I guess it depends on, on who you ask as well, mm. it is seen as something that sort of an example of um, things or or problematic issues to avoid mm. and and when you looked upon the, this uh, this uh, world of um, and trying to put consent into the law uh, if i understood you correctly you also mean that uh, the finnish way of of interpretive uh, or seeing that concept is is um, it doesn't do very much to the to the law as it is right now it wouldn't do so much. Yes, or well, there is uh, so there is currently a draft law uh, which has been criticized quite a lot. So I don't think that it will necessarily come into force as it is, mm. uh, and the the uh, government bill is still uh, to be presented before Parliament. So we don't actually know what the final draft sort of will look like. Uh, but according to the draft law that we have at this point, it is a combination of the current law and a kind of a consent-based mm. uh, legislation. So uh, the first sentence of the section on rape, I'm now uh, especially talking about the section on rape, is um, stating that uh, rape is sexual intercourse um, where one person does not uh, participate voluntarily, which is very similar to, to the Swedish formulation. But instead of the examples mentioned in the Swedish section on rape, uh, which are more inclusive, um, there are only two examples then listed in this section. Um, and those are very similar to the current uh, law. Hmm. So one is uh, where the perpetrator uses force then physical force or threat to use force or uh, the other situation where um, the perpetrator uses the, the sort of vulnerable position of mm. uh, the victim. Mm. So there is um, sort of an, an um, question um, mm. that we also uh, want to raise here because that is something that that leaves a very open sort of how how will this then be interpreted because mm. there's there seems to be um, an initiative to move into another direction, but still this sort of clinging to the old, um, which is, of course, something in criminal law that that often happens. And in, I guess in law in general, because one always builds on the, the previous traditions um, and to introduce completely new theoretical concepts is something, of course, when it comes to criminal law. So you are talking about how to sentence people. It is something mm -hmm. that's seen as very risky so um yeah that's uh, yeah, yeah. Well, what if if you should answer uh, shortly what are the lessons to be learned from finland okay so um i think um well first of all it's it's something that we also want to address in the keynote um that there is this public uh, large public debate uh, I think Mylen also touched touched upon this very well uh, when she said that almost everyone has sort of an opinion on what the 
section on rape is supposed to look like and what consent is and um, and so on and so forth. There is this sort of obsession in the public debate on criminal law and this sort of um, really belief mm. in the power of criminal law to change uh, society and to change people's sexual behaviors. Mm. Um, and also uh, politically uh, focusing on criminal law, that is something that tends to unite the very sort of right-wing parties um, and the left-wing parties. So it is something, um, especially when it comes to sentences um, and harsher punishments is sort of a uh, something that is also, I would say, quite trendy. Uh, but something that I think, well, key lessons from this is that when focusing on criminal law like this, not saying that it's it's uh, not important, of course, it has a, an important role to play. But there are so many questions that we uh, tend to forget about. Um, attitudes, uh, societal attitudes, attitudes in the court system, um, in the uh, law enforcement, uh, for example, what support services are given to given to victims mm. um many of these sort of more difficult um more perhaps um long-term um discussions are sort of being a little bit forgotten about uh when just addressing the problem of sexual violence as a criminal legal problem and that was a very nice way to end uh, in Finland for now because and but before we jump into that uh, field actually and talk about multiple approaches uh, to to uh, uh, law and uh, where to put this crime in a way but so we will go to Iceland but before that I think we need a break so if you will come to join us and listen on a very interesting, exciting talk with Hildur Fjola Antonsdottir afterwards. And then we will go into a panel discussion. I think that will be a good idea. So get, go out, feel the air, uh, breathe a little bit and be back here in 10 minutes. <laughs>